it's been said that if you design and develop for the extremes, the middle will take care of itself. And it's often that we don't consider these extremes, things like device, uh, their, the user's income level, and disability. So we're going to focus on one today, disability. I'm Marcy Sutton. I'm here to talk to you about enabling our users in client-rendered applications, because it's often that we completely miss accessibility. I work on accessibility tools for developers at DQ Systems, including the Axe Core framework. I care a lot about the intersection of JavaScript with HTML and CSS, and I've spent a fair amount of time writing and speaking about JavaScript frameworks because of their impact on people. There's a lot of pitfalls out there. I'm going to be pretty blunt that accessibility is in, not in the best shape. And it starts with how we learn to code. And this really impacts people. We forget things as basic as form labels. And that was true for me when I got started. I was a new developer, too. And I didn't understand headings or buttons or even what the ARIA uh, spec is for. But that all changed when I started working for a client who had been sued for accessibility. And through that engagement, I met users with disabilities, and I learned how much my work mattered to them. And that meant a lot to me. I met people like Sarah Outwater, my friend who's blind and awesome. Sarah navigates the web with a screen reader, and she navigates the web with her guide dog, Ferdinand. For people like Ian McKay and Todd Stablefelt, who are both paralyzed from the neck down, they can see and talk, but they can't physically interact with their mobile device. So they depend on technology like switch access uh, to power smart, device, uh, smart home devices and all kinds of things. For people like Todd and Ian and Sarah and millions of other people with disabilities, we leave them behind if we don't consider accessibility in our applications. And frankly, any one of us is one bike accident away from having a disability or having a friend or a family member with a disability. So this stuff really matters to life, and I think we can do better. My hope for this talk is to open that door to, for many of you to accessibility and to make champions for accessibility out of you, because I think you're all capable of doing this, so let's, let's make it better out there. Today, we're going to talk about accessibility debugging. I'm going to do a bit of live coding. And we can't get to all of it. It's a pretty big topic. But we're going to focus on focus management, no pun intended. Uh, we'll look at the number one fail in accessibility, which is color contrast. And then we'll try to cement this in your workflow using automated testing. You already have the most basic accessibility testing tool, the keyboard. So that means that you can actually get started with accessibility testing. And again, we won't get to cover everything, but I'm going to try and hit on the most common fails that I see out there for accessibility, starting with the keyboard. To accomplish this, I'm going to use a React application I made that has a lot of common accessibility problems. You can find it on GitHub. I'm going to go over to my text editor. Um, actually, the first thing I'm going to do is show you the app. So my little accessibility demo app, if I click through, you can see there's a sidebar. It's got some items in it. I've got a little sign up modal with a form in, in it. And this, uh, if I click through, or tab through with my keyboard, rather, I don't get any feedback. I can't see where, I'm on, where I am on the screen. Um, there's no focus states. Uh, my focus management isn't handled. And so for someone with a disability, this is a really big problem. Um, and it's so common. Like I see this all the time. So let's go fix this stuff, first of all. Um, if, to start with, I have a button here. And if I inspect it, it's a real button element, so that's a good start. Um, but it didn't have a focus state. And I can actually force the focus state here in the DevTools uh, in Chrome. And I can see there's, there's nothing in the, the style of the button itself. But if I scroll through the styles, maybe I'll find something. And yeah, sure enough, that on the wildcard selector, I have outline none. And if I disable that, I can actually see the little focus outline of where I am on the screen. So fail number one, we can go fix in our code. So in my CSS, yeah, there it is, top level, outline none. Let's get rid of it. You should never use outline none. It's a huge problem, because you're basically disabling the focus style for every single element. 
Now, if, you're, if you have a lot of mouse users that hate that blue outline, because I've worked on Angular, I've gotten the bug reports, you can look into something called what input or focus ring. I don't have time to cover them today, but those are tools that let you be a bit more specific with how you apply focus styles. So the next thing I'm going to show you is in my app.js file, I'm going to add a little trick for debugging called a focus in listener. I bind it to the document. I'm going to limit this to not run in production. Uh, but all it does is when any element on the page gets focused, I can log the document.active element. And if I go back to my app, now when I tab around, let's get rid of this. Settings. OK, so now if I tab through this app, I can see log to the console which element I'm on. And this really helps me to debug so I can see exactly what's happening. And my sidebar is not actually hiding the elements that are off screen. So this is another huge problem. And it affects people who rely on the keyboard to navigate web pages and applications when it's not a one-to-one -one for sighted users and keyboard and screen reader users. Um, so what we need to do is actually hide these sidebar items when this thing is closed. And we're going to use my trusty tool called inert. Inert is an attribute working its way back into HTML uh, through the Web Incubator Community Group. It's available in Chrome behind a flag. And you, you need a polyfill for this, because it's not really implemented anywhere else. But we can go and add this to our menu code. So I've got a menu.js file. I'm going to scroll down and find a good spot. So in my JSX for this menu, I want to put this on the wrapper of the menu. But I don't want it to include that, uh, that trigger button that I have there. So the first thing I'm going to do is just add inert. I'm going to give it, uh, I'm going to hinge it off of the state of the sidebar. And if it's open, I don't want the inert attribute. So I'm going to pass it null, a little bit ternary operator here. If it is, if it's closed, I want that inert attribute to be there because it will block focus inside of the menu. It'll disable it for screen reader users so they aren't getting stuck in things that they can't use. So I'm going to pass it an empty string. So this is a Boolean attribute in HTML. So now, if I go back to my app, I shouldn't be getting into those items. And they are appropriately hidden now, which is really useful. There's one other problem with this sidebar that I figured out so far, which is that it's not a real button. It uses a div. I don't know how many of you have used a click event on a div, but the hair on the back of your neck should go up, because it's really, you can make a div accessible, but it's so much easier if you start with a button element. So let's go over to our menu again. And I'm actually going to go to my specific class for this menu button. And even the name of it is a signifier that we've done something wrong, because it's called a menu icon. But an icon isn't necessarily interactive. It's the button that we're after. So if I go down to where this JSX is defined, it is a div. So I'm going to change that to a button. And then it doesn't have any text in it. So a screen reader user wouldn't know what this button is for. It just has those three lines. So I'm going to use the aria label property. Uh, and I'm just going to give it open menu. And so now a screen reader user can, can reach this thing. And when you turn on a screen reader, it will say open menu. So we've done a few things to this. But we still aren't handling focus management. And this is really critical. So when the menu opens, we want to send the user's focus into this thing so that they're in the right spot, and it's announced. So the, the items are in an unordered list. It will save five items. And we can send their focus there and then send it back when the thing closes. And I prefer focus management because it's the, the keyboard mechanics of your app are really critical to get a keyboard user in the right spot. So for that, we're going to use refs in React. And I'm going to start by going to, uh, I guess for this, we're actually going to use the state of the sidebar. So that when the state changes to show this thing be open, we're going to send focus into it. So I'm going to say if state dot is open, and then I've done a little magic here to actually send focus to an item with a ref of called first item. So we have to go add that ref to the first item. I'm using React Router, so I'm just going to put a string here of first item, because that ends up getting put into the React Router component um, onto the anchor itself. So when that gets focused, when I open this menu, my focus is now sent into it, and a keyboard and screen reader user is in the right place. So the other thing I need to do is when I actually change the view, 
the React router doesn't go close the sidebar for me. I need to go do that. So let's go back to our app. And when I, when I interact with that item, I'm actually going to use a click event. I'm going to overload this link to make it do what we want. So on click, I'm going to bind a new method that I'm going to define in a second called this.pagefocus. Nope. This.pagefocus.bind. And I'm going to bind it to the current scope. And I'm going to pass it a new ref. I'm going to pass a string, because I'm actually going to define a reusable method. Um, and the ref is going to go on the main. We're going to send focus to the main element. And to do that, we need to add a tab index property. And I'm going to add negative 1, because we don't want to add the main element to the tab order. We just want to make it be able to catch that focus state with, the, with scripting. But then I need to add a ref to it. So we're going to add a ref, say node. And then I'm going to call it this.main so it attaches it to the current scope. And then we'll define it as this node. So we are defining this, this ref now. And we need to define our page focus method. So page focus is a reusable method I can use for each of these React router items. I'm only working on the first one so far. But it takes a string ref looks it up on the current scope. It will set the state of the menu to false to close it, and it will go send focus to the ref as a string that we passed it. So our menu should be in much better shape now. We can focus on the current item, and it will take us to the content. So we're really moving the user's focus through this application to get them in the right spot and to announce the content. So that's a pretty big improvement. Anytime you have a layer opening over the page or something, you need to send the user's focus there, or else they'll get stuck behind everything. So we fixed up our menu. We also have this modal that, since we've enabled the focus state again, we can see I'm using uh, React modal. It's a pre-made component that does some accessibility stuff for you. It will, it's obviously sending focus into the content. Um, but I've got a form in here that might have some problems. So I'm going to run a tool called Axe Coconut. It's an extension that I work on that it has experimental rules enabled. It supports Shadow DOM. It is our pre-release um, extension that sort of you can use alongside our more stable extension called Axe Chrome. So if I run this extension, I can see that it's catching a pretty major problem. For, um, I'm, I'm assuming it's coming from our modal because it says in the selector React modal. And the current version of React modal is unfortunately adding an ARIA hidden uh, attribute, and it's disabling everything on the page. So I can actually show you what this sounds like in a screen reader. So that was kind of underwhelming, because there's no accessibility information. It has been stripped completely from that page. And X Coconut is telling us very helpfully with this experimental rule that it has been disabled. So if I go and inspect it, yeah, it's disabling it on the body. So in React Modal, in that version of it, we can fix that pretty quickly by going and adding a call to modal.setAppElement. And I'm going to pass it an ID of root. And that is my app. So if we go look at it in, in the DOM inspector, there's an ID of root on this div. And that's the contents of my app. But then the modal gets inserted as a sibling. So we only want the co app content to be hidden when the modal opens. So if I open this thing, now aria hidden of true is on the correct element. So that's why it's super important to actually fire up a screen reader and see, are you hiding everything unintentionally so a screen reader can't use anything on your app? Um, and so that's pretty helpful. So the next thing I want to do is I'm going to run, let's look at what Axe Coconut found again. It found a bunch of color contrast problems. And that's really interesting uh, because that's the most common accessibility fail on the web. Huge problem. So we need to get the contrast up. It's actually reporting on the stuff behind in the main application. And it is pretty dim. So if you were low vision or you can't see the screen very well, but you can see a little bit, the contrast of this ends up being a, a huge blocker. So the way I debug color contrast is from Axe Coconut, I can go and inspect it. And I'm in Chrome Canary, where I have a color debugging tool turned on. And the color for that H1 is actually coming from a parent element, a div with a class of primary. In the 
element inspector, actually in the little uh, style inspector, I can go and click on this color, and in Chrome Canary, in this experiment, it will actually show me the line of where the contrast problems are. And I can go, I can click on this little thing, and it'll tell me that it fails both the levels of the web content accessibility guidelines. There's AA and AAA, and there's different levels here. We can actually go and pick a better color and make sure that it passes, and you can see that ratio for the size of text of the H1, we want to get it to 3 to 1, and the body copy needs to be 4.5 to 1 for that color ratio. So I'm just going to go and copy that hex code, put it in my CSS. So I have it in two places, because, you know, of course, it's a demo app, so it's not the cleanest CSS. Um, but to, to verify that this is fixed, I have my, my demo app running in one tab. And in another tab, I'm going to run some integration tests. So I can do npm run integration, and this is actually going to fire up some accessibility tests that I've written. So I have some tests for the home page, and then I have another set of tests that go and open up that modal programmatically and run uh, some tests over there. So it's finding the same things that we found in the in the coconut extension, and that's really useful for debugging in your test suite, maybe uh, adding them to your continuous integration environment. So let's go look at what those tests look like real quick. So I'm using Selenium WebDriver here to open up a real browser instance, and that's useful because it's more like what a real user would experience. Then I'm using a library called Axe WebDriver JS, which pulls in the Axe Core framework. It will uh, kind of inject it into the browser instance for you, including iframes, which is really useful. And then my two tests will go and run the full set of Axe Core's rules. It will return me a JSON object, and then I can assert things based on that object. So that's a really great thing. You should be writing tests for accessibility, and you can use Axe Core or Axe WebDriver JS so that you don't have to write all that boilerplate code. Um, and so by doing a, a bit of test-driven development, you can go and find these accessibility problems, fix them, and then get everything passing. So that's a helpful workflow. Let's go. Back to the slides. So we've covered some of the mechanics and the really common problems with accessibility. And you can use these tools to uncover common problems. In this demo, we saw the Chrome Accessibility Inspector. Uh, we saw Inert, the Coconut Extension, WebDriver.js. And in my slides, I have some more resources for you, including ways that you can go and vote for Inert, because we need it in more browsers. The alternative to Inert is really painful. You can take my word for it. Uh, you have to do a lot of things with tab index and walking the DOM. And if you're working on a framework, it's a nightmare. So we could use your support for inert. So go vote for it. There's some more accessibility resources here. And uh, I just tweeted my slides before the talk. So you can go and check these out a little bit later. So I know that you are all capable of making the web more accessible, and I hope that this talk will make an impact on you. So if you have any questions about accessibility, about how to use AxCore, hit me up on Twitter, and I believe in you. Thank you. Yeah.